Bank is us. Follow your heart, use your head. Triodos Bank. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, first presentation, first Schumacher lectures of the Bristol, first Bristol Big Green Week. Um, we've got a very important uh, lineup of speakers this evening. Uh, with us this evening, we've got um, James Vaccaro, who's uh, head uh, of the uh, investment banking uh, arm of Triodos uh, Bank. Uh, James has worked at Triodos since 1998 and is a, a specialist in environmental and social finance. Uh, to my right, I've got Clive Hamilton, who is the um, Australian... <laughs> He's moved left. <laughs> He's moved left now. Thank you very much. It's a problem with sitting in a big chair. Um, Clive Hamilton, who is the Australian Public Intellectual and Professor of Public Ethics at the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics uh, at the Australian National University uh, in the University of Melbourne. He's been 14 years Executive Director of the Institu Australian Institute, a uh, progressive think tank uh, which he uh, founded. And on my right this time, I've got Jonathan, who you all know uh, is a founder member of Forum uh, for the Future, a very well-known speaker and leading thinker on sustainable issues, and a very valued colleague of mine at Wessex Water. But first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. John Rogers uh, to introduce the evening. Okay, well, thank you very much. And it's great to see this room so full, uh, and it's great to see the sun, and it's great to welcome you all to Bristol. Um, this room is, always, is used by the council, so you can understand that every week we have intelligent discourse, uh, the ability to share ideas about the future of Bristol and the future of the country and indeed the future of the world. And I think that tonight will be no exception. Um, it's, it's fantastic to see everybody. I'd like to particularly thank um, Darren and uh, Paul for all the work they've done behind the scenes uh, in terms of getting this together as part of the Forum for the Future and uh, Bristol Green Capital. And also thank the sponsors. We've heard already from Triodos. Um, Bristol City Council is also sponsoring this. Wessex Water and Good Energy. And you've got other sponsors there. Business West wanted me to mention they're improving your resource efficiency. And Business West, obviously, is the other people who run the city. Uh, so I thought I'd better mention them as well. Uh, but I, I was asked to speak for as short a time as possible. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Just before we move on, can I ask you all to make sure that uh, if you haven't got an off switch on your mobile phones, uh, you switch them off now, put them on to silence. Uh, thanks very much. And there's something else that I should add. We were going to have a film from uh, Bill McKibben uh, in the United States, who is the founder of 350.com. Uh, Unfortunately, there have been technical issues, and we can't show that film this evening. So I'm going to hand you over to, straight over to uh, James for Caro. James. The session is, is around who says we can manage the planet, which I, I like because it kind of almost infers we've got a choice, um, which clearly we don't. Um, a lot of talks generally kind of talk around sort of knowledge and the diagnosis. I'm wanting to focus mostly in terms of what we can do. Um, I'm going to be looking principally at the financial crisis, but actually Actually, unlike the sort of the, the general documentary, which is 59 minutes of what happened, and then one last minute of what the seeds of what we might be able to do about it, I want to reverse that, um, because I find more interesting the question, what is it we need to do on the basis of what we've learned? So I'm going to take you through the financial crisis in 90 seconds, because there's a bit of a speed trap for, uh, for the talkers today. Um, so, so wish me luck, and uh, I'm, I am going to be on fast forward. So in the beginning, there were banks, and banks were lending money in their communities, and people trusted them. And for some odd reason, they used to wear suits and funny hats, don't know why. Uh, then they got bigger, and they merged, and they became public in the stock market. And in the boom years, Banks were suddenly trying to compete for capital against other kinds of companies. And they couldn't really do that within the realm of being a bank because banks have to 
provide a social purpose. And to be able to stretch things within that model was very difficult. So what they did was they lobbied to get regulations relaxed, the very regulations which were keeping them uh, to what they did. And those got blown apart to the extent that they started to do things which were not banking. They were starting to do things which were trading. They were starting to do things which, in a way, took them away from the very relationships which banks were there for. And so they started doing more and more of this stuff, the high-term, high short-term profit, more risky stuff, until there were hardly banks at all. In fact, globally systemic, uh, the, the too big to fail banks are actually doing about 37% loan relationships until they crashed. They crashed. Yes, there was a subprime, which was fraud. Yes, there was the CDO market, which was negligence. But all of those things are effects, not causes. People blamed the banks. They were all greedy, although the people down at the branches with their funny suits, they wouldn't have known what was really going on. Um, the regulators, the ratings agencies, they were asleep on the job, but there were a set of complex rules. They didn't really understand how to apply them. The governments, they were seen as weak, um, although they realized that they needed banks in order to, go th to, to keep the economy alive. Fund managers were asleep on the job, um, and yet they said, well, it's fiduciary responsibility. We just need to create profits for people. And then people, us, the customers, and kind of owners of the bank, well, we don't have the time. I mean, it's hard times enough, and actually interest rates are pretty rubbish at the moment. So what can we do? So they nationalised some of the banks, um, and people said, oh, RBS, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been taken over now, so now we're all bankers. Um, well, we were bankers before. Uh, in the sense that we all owned the banks before. Most of you would have owned them. I would guess the majority of you um, wouldn't have known whether you owned it or not. But it wasn't clear. Governments have now taken over those banks. They're crumbling under the burden of debt. And everyone's hoping that Angela Merkel is going to sort it all out like the, sort of the, the ultimate grown-up after the kids have trashed the, uh, the house of the party. So what is it we need to do? What is it we need to do? Well, the first thing is recognise it as a system. Yes, it's a complex system. There's lots of players within that system. Some of them have got dubious motivations. A lot of incentives within that system. Not many of them are aligned, most of them in the short term. And it is a system which we are in. We are all fundamentally connected to it. Within the banking system, we are the other side of that. And the planet is a system. So I'm using the financial system as an analogy for the other things which we're wanting to be connected in. And not just because it seems to be a good analogy, but because money has a specific role to play within everything we do in that it transforms ideas into action. Uniquely transforms ideas into action. Money in that sense is not neutral. The second thing in terms of recognising our, our, our opportunities for action is to step out of the cycle of blame. It's very, very easy to blame, um, and I empathise for all the causes for doing so. Um, the bankers, who were actually traders, because they don't deserve to be called bankers because they weren't having any relationships, earning a million pounds, or the Fred Goodwins, um, do cause massive emotions, and so they should. However, just getting back at them by stripping of their knighthoods or name-calling doesn't actually really shift the system on. What we need to look at is how can we actually re-engage with our own power? Well, what does it mean, our own power? We don't have much power in the system. We don't have much money. Or do we? For the average person, the median salary being about £20,000 at the moment in the UK, um, we look at those bankers, traders of a million pounds with rage, and yet for the majority world who are only earning a couple of dollars a day, the ratio between our 20,000 and their salary is actually the same ratio between the million pound trader banker and ours. And therefore, actually, collectively, we have got a lot of power. I'm not saying that the blame needs to rest with us, but I am saying that we have to fundamentally redress what we can actually do as individuals. And I think that's what started the conversation at Occupy. There the conversation was, what's wrong? And people wanted to just understand what's wrong. And I think we've been resting with this for a while now, and we need to move it on and actually ask the question, what's next? The starting point for what's wrong is, well, what's going on with this system? I can't fathom it out. And there's CDOs, and are they like lending to somebody else? And then there's derivatives, and they're, they're something quite complicated. It's enough to make you just go home. It is very, very disempowering. And actually, I would argue it's not a good starting point for us. 
the people who move things on most in the world, understanding the absolute complexity of the system that they're in is not actually their starting point. Entrepreneurs don't start, start there. They will actually take creative ideas and say, hey, actually, rather than making buildings out of brick in a different way, how about we make them out of straw bale? Um, how about if you were to recycle products into things which are more useful? How about if you do things which are actually not the norm? There's an awful lot of vision and will and solutions within entrepreneurial thinking, whether that's in the private sector or in other sectors, in social enterprise or in charities indeed. The entrepreneurs take the thing, how can we be part of the solution and how can we be responsible for managing it? How can we stand up and say, I will take my share of responsibility in managing it? We are, and it's treated us, incredibly humble to be able to support these people who are trying to create new ideas, what we feel are the solutions which are addressing the, the challenges of society and planet. How do we do that? Well, if you go back to what bankers used to be in their socially useful purpose, there's a triangle I'd like you to imagine. The entrepreneur comes with the will and the vision and the idea and the responsibility to take charge of a situation and create a solution. The banker, in its best form, is there to be able to ground that, to be able to understand it, to understand the risk on behalf of people who won't have the time, to be able to make sure that things are in balance from a commercial point of view, because in order to be healthy from a planetary and a social point of view, it also has to be healthy from a practical point of view. And to complete the triangle, all of our money, the thing which turns the ideas into action, is required to be able to make things happen in the world. That's something which can be quite energising and something that we've been able to be a part of in things like growing markets in renewable energy. When I started 14 years ago or so in renewable energy, renewable energy was alternative. It was not something of the future. It was something of the something else. And yet, through being able to craft it and be able to grind it down into, well, how does this work? How does the commercial things fit together? How do these contracts work? What is the health of the system from a practical point of view? It was able to develop into a market, into a market which then others come into, others then spot and, and will come into, maybe just because it's more profitable to do so, but it's being able to be able to make that something which is grounded, that we can then move on and create more solutions. And that's more important, being able to take a relationship with entrepreneurs, so folk at uh, Ecotricity or wherever, where they've started from small roots and are now sort of in that train, that there are the proven models, that we can actually kind of move things on. That's actually more important than being able to say, well, we've done this much renewable energy. It's being able to be a footprint for that activity that we can go on and replicate and then other people can go, well, okay, we can use that too. Now, you might say, well, hang on a second, this is all about growth. Uh, well, we're a bit unsure about growth. And so you should be, because in a way, there's been a whole kind of uh, ideal about growth equals good. And we've come to learn that that isn't right. Um, making the cake bigger is somehow just not fulfilling us. But Nisa's retraction, if you went to Greece at the moment, the opposite of growth doesn't feel particularly good either. We don't need to make the cake bigger, we need to make it more nutritious, and we need to make it in such a way that it sustains itself. And because there's going to be natural decline, because an awful lot of what we have built is based on very, very shaky foundations, it's going to fall over and not be with us, we need to be able to build and grow a new alternative. How do we do this um, in a new way? One of the main things which we need to do is look at ownership. If you go right back to my analysis, that primal cause of the financial crisis somewhere in that interface of ownership, everyone was kind of doing it for someone else's benefit. And we're somewhere within that, although a sort of a passenger within a, within a very complex vehicle. But there's more forms of active ownership now. There's cooperatives, there's peer lending, there's there's organisations who are entirely designed to be transparent and to include you. There's direct investments in companies, be they social or environmental, 
who actually want participation of stakeholders because they, they, they've actually kind of built that into their business model. I think that owning banks, because of the social purpose that banks play, should be a different type of ownership. We should not be comparing it to owning a technology which may or may not become something which transforms. This is something which is fundamental to us. Ownership is no longer a good enough word for what we need to have as the relationship to banks. Alongside others in the Global Alliance, there's lots of banks and credit unions, microfinance organisations who are working to try and reconnect people to values and have a new experience, to be able to put people in the picture so that they reconceive money not as something which is neutral, nor as a commodity, but something which actually plays the fundamental role in defining their relationship with other people. This is what I'm going to be able to do with my money, which brings your ideas into action, because I need your ideas to be brought into action in order to serve my future. Last point, because I know we're short of time, um, is looking at the incentives which are in the system and being able to drive us towards something which is long term. Everything in the system at the moment is short term. Banks are short term, super short term. Trading used to happen on the stock market. People used to hold shares for eight years. The average is now around three months, although there's hedge funds who can trade within milliseconds. You can potentially get to the point where trading systems can go into picoseconds, a trillionth of a second. Everything moves at high speed. But then governments move at high speed too, and they will follow. And in fact, well, we all move at high speed now as well. Where can you break the cycle of being able to get incentives, which aren't just, aren't just being able to do the necessary things, like in the natural capital declaration, we're going to be able to reprice um, natural resources so that we can make it more profitable to do things which are better for the planet. But how can we actually do things where our entire operating system means that we're incentivized to do things in a more balanced way rather than only accepting that profits will be in the lead? And I think that there's certain things there by incentivizing community investment, loyalty dividends. We can actually start to move some of the thinking towards the long term. We can maybe start to rephrase some of the language which we have. Rainy day money is always based around fear. It's the fear of the future, so we'll put some money by, because money might just protect us. However, the money that we keep there, earning as much interest as we can, because we need to be protected, is being kept driven into the very system which is causing a lot of the things which we, in the news pages, realise that is what is ailing our society and is driving us down quicker in the same way as we struggle in quicksand and we drown faster. Perhaps we need to have happy day money, where we put money aside to create the vision of the world which we actually want to live on, and actually that will mean that our money has some kind of meaning in the future, because it will be no good having a pension if we can't spend it in the world. In the Netherlands, they're recognising that they need to build an infrastructure. It's quite easy when you've got a country which is four metres under sea level on average, that they have to start investing in what they have to do because it's no good just creating a sum of money if the entire country is underwater. I think my call to action is that we all recognise that this microcosm that we have of passing things on, waiting for the grown-ups to arrive, which we'll see in Rio, where we're hoping that the governments or international government will somehow miraculously waltz into the room and sort us out for us, is not going to happen, and it's time for us to take charge. Yes, I would like you to put some happy day money with us, but the biggest thing I'd like you to do is to socialise this concept, is to have the conversations. People will act differently and more positively when things are unseen. Money has been our greatest secret and our greatest fear. And so my <coughs> challenge to you is to start integrating it into the sustainability of the debate and to have the conversations which we need to have as to how it all binds together. Thanks very much. Thank you, James. Now, we're, we're going to take questions right at the end. And as you can see, you've got microphones in uh, front of you, so you can uh, be heard when you ask your questions. Um, now, I'm going to move on to Clive. Um, Clive uh, has written a book recently, which uh, will be, he will be signing later on. And it's uh, A Requiem of a Species, Why We Resist the Truth 
about climate change, and uh, certainly there's plenty of that going on. Clive. Thanks very much for that <coughs> introduction and for the invitation <coughs> um, to come and open, in a way, this uh, fantastic venture, the Big Green Week. Um, let's hope uh, it does uh, for Bristol what uh, the Edinburgh Festival has done for that city, and you'll be able to say you were here at the start. Well, my talk uh, <coughs> tonight is titled The New Sorcerer's Apprentices. Masters of the earth or merely stewards? The overseer species or the caretaker one? When our world leaders come together at Rio Plus 20 uh, later this month, uh, two decades, of course, after the first Rio Earth Summit, behind the debates and declarations, I think these two, co two competing understandings of the nature of our, of our species will contend. When the Rio Plus uh, 20 conference coordinator declared uh, that the summit should be a special general meeting of the shareholders of Earth Incorporated, her words reflected, I think, just how effectively sustainable development has been captured by corporate thinking. Earth Incorporated uh, presents the planet as a business enterprise whose output is to be maximised in the interests of the shareholders. That's us, presumably. Although you might think that when the shares were doled out, yours came without voting rights. <laughs> Yet scientists are now thinking uh, about the Earth in a way that seems to dovetail nicely with the idea of the Earth as one gigantic asset to be managed. Uh, back at Rio in 1992, the environment was understood as the domain that surrounds us, the place to which we go to draw resources and dump our wastes or perhaps even leave alone. The economists characterised damage uh, to the environment as an externality, an unfortunate side effect of market activity. So at Rio 1992, the environment was seen as essential but separate from us. It was over there. And the scientific arguments were consistent with treating the environment as separate from the main game, that is, human activity. But scientific thinking has changed radically over the last two decades, so that what we used to think of as the environment, the natural world spread around us, no longer exists. In place of the environment, we now have the Earth system, the collection of inter interdependent spheres that make up the planet, the hydrosphere, the watery parts, the geosphere, the Earth's crust and what lies beneath, the biosphere, living things, and the atmosphere, the air. Earth system science now conceives of these spheres as intimately connected, linked by a number of planetary processes like the hydrological cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and so on. And in the Earth system, humans have not merely transformed the landscape, but have imprinted themselves on every cubic metre of air and water, so that each year, the Earth becomes more and more like a human artefact. Thinking of the Earth as a system represents a profound shift. A system is a whole made up entirely of its parts. As a system, the Earth becomes an entity that is distinct, um, uh, separable, graspable by the human mind, and certain, the kind of entity that defines the realm of scientific understanding. Beyond that, there is no longer anything of the world, nothing with unknowable and unanalyzable depth. If human influence has been so pervasive and powerful that there is no more nature, we are left only with elements of the Earth system showing various levels of human disturbance. So the default position is no longer how to minimise our impact, 
but how best to intervene. The goal can no longer be to live in harmony with nature, the hope enshrined in the 1992 Rio Declaration, but how to manage the Earth system. In place of the first Rio Summit's call to conserve, protect and restore ecosystems, which now seems like wishful thinking, the task of Rio Plus 20 will, begin, will be to begin planning for how best to govern the Earth as a whole. Before we could see the Earth, sorry, before we could see the globe as the Earth system, we first had to see it in a new way, as a total object. And I think a crucial event in that perceptual shift occurred with the dissemination in December 1972 of the iconic photograph of the Earth taken by the Apollo 17 spacecraft. Now, it's often said that the first full image of the blue planet revealed it to be precious, fragile, and protected only by a thin layer of atmosphere. And it reinforced the imperative for better stewardship of our only home. Against these numinous readings by some, the NASA photograph also entrenched the apprehension of the Earth as a total object and reinforced the conception of the Earth as a resource to be used for our own ends. In this way, the blue planet image was not a break from technological thinking, but its affirmation. It provided pictorial corroboration of the distancing of humans from the Earth and validated the conception of the planet as an independent entity seen by humans and so became the legitimate dom domain of technological manipulation. So for those drawn to the mastery project, by entrenching the image of the world as a conceivable, visible, total object, the photograph prompts the idea that the Earth itself could be subject to regulation. This task of planetary management is not one for the future. It's upon us now, with plans in train for engineering the climate. How is this happening? <coughs> Technologies designed to regulate the climate system are now being developed by a number of research groups. Scientists are busy. Investors are raising capital. And patents are being granted. For example, a patent has been taken out on an ocean pump for bringing cold water to the surface. The colder waters, it's hoped, would enhance the capacity of oceans to soak up more carbon dioxide. And if it works, the owners at some future point might be able to generate carbon credits to sell. The owners listed on this patent include a number of researchers, along with Bill Gates, and Nathan Mervold, former Chief Technology Office, Officer at Microsoft, and Lowell Wood, the legendary Pentagon nuclear weapons developer and Star Wars missile shield advocate, who's now moved into geoengineering. Among the various methods of geoengineering attracting the attention of scientists and venture capitalists are proposals to spray iron slurry across large areas of ocean to enhance or encourage algal blooms that will soak up more carbon dioxide and, with luck, take that carbon to the ocean depths for safer storage. A number of ocean iron fertilisation experiments have been carried out, some more respectable than others. In 2007, a company named Planktos, set up by an entrepreneur with a colourful background, and financed by a Canadian real estate developer, announced plans to fertilise the oceans near the Galapagos Islands. With an eye to the growing market for carbon offsets, Planktos's environmental claims were plausible enough for gullible investors to raise the value of the company 
to $90 million. As the ship set sail, the responsible authorities got wind of it and stopped the voyage. The venture collapsed. Carbon Engineering Limited is a company formed by climate scientist David Keith to develop technology to capture carbon dioxide from the air on an industrial scale. Bill Gates is an investor. Another is N. Murray Edwards, a Canadian oil billionaire and the largest investor in Al Alberta's tar sands, the worst kind of fossil fuel development. James Hansen has said that if those tar sands are fully developed, then it's game over for the climate. It's a little like a tobacco corporation donating to cancer research, and the cancer research is accepting the money. But the geoengineering technology most likely to be deployed in the coming decades is a proposal to regulate the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth's surface by injecting a layer of sulphate aerosols, tiny particles that reflect solar radiation, into the upper atmosphere, stratospheric aerosol part particle injection, it's called. The idea for this solar shield was stimulated by observing the cooling effect of large volcanic eruptions. The 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo, for example, cooled the Earth by half a degree or so for a couple of years. The climatic effects of large volcanic eruptions have been noticed at least since the eruption of Iceland's Mount Lackey in 1783, when Benjamin Franklin wrote home from Paris attributing the abnormally cold winter to the dry fog that had for months enshrouded the Northern Hemisphere. The year 1816 became known as the year without a summer. The cause of the missing season was Mount Tambora in Sumbawa, Indonesia, the eruption of which some months earlier was classified as, or subsequently classified as, super colossal. The aerosol veil that enveloped the world brought on a cold, wet winter in the United States and Western Europe. The summer was marked by spectacular sunsets caused by the haze, a phenomenon that found artistic expression in the red skies of William Turner's paintings. In the same year, 1816, 18-year-old 18 Mary Godwin was trapped indoors by, as she wrote, incessant rainfall while holidaying in the Swiss Alps. To pass the time, she and her companions, Percy Bysshe Shelley and Lord Byron, challenged each other to concoct horror stories. Inspired by a dream, Mary told a tale that would three years later become the novel Frankenstein, which carried the subtitle, The Modern Prometheus. Intellectual Ventures a company founded by Nathan Mervold, and in which Bill Gates is an investor, has developed a technology for mimicking the effects of volcanic eruptions by injecting a layer of sulphate aerosols into the upper atmosphere. It has patented what it calls the stratos, strato shield, a hose suspended in the sky by blimps that would pump sulphur sulphate aerosols into the upper atmosphere. The layer of sulphate aerosols encircling the Earth could be adjusted, so it would work like a planetary thermostat. The device is marketed as a practical, low-cost way to reverse catastrophic warming of the Arctic or the entire planet. Nathan Mervold defends private ownership of climate engineering technologies like the stratospheric shield, on the grounds that it prevents the technology falling into the wrong hands. <laughs> if we've arrived at the point where the task can no longer be to minimise our disturbance to the environment, but to manage the Earth as a whole, 
we must ask ourselves a far-reaching question. Are we capable of managing the earth? Are we up to the task? Or, by promoting ourselves from janitor to manager, are we destined to botch it? On this question, which I believe will be the defining question of the 21st century, we can expect the world to divide into two camps. The Prometheans, after the Greek god who gave humans the tools of technological mastery, and those who, and it took me a while to do, work out the best um, alternative, who might be called Satyrians, after the Greek goddess of safety, caution and deliverance. Satyrians acutely aware of the history of hubris, will view Earth system engineering as the last phase of the Earth's disenchantment and expect any future planetary regulatory agency to make a mess of it with potentially devastating consequences. Dismissing these self-doubts, the ever-optimistic Prometheans will be confident that Homo sapiens can take control of the Earth and manage it successfully and do so in perpetuity. Because once we start, there will be no going back. Thinking like an earth system engineer has insinuated itself into unexpected places. Arkim Steiner, the chief of the UN Environment Program and a man who will play a key role at Rio Plus 20, has called on world leaders to better manage the planet. If this kind of thinking is slipping unnoticed into unexpected places, it's being embraced enthusiastically in others. While many of those who've begun to speak of planetary management use the language of engineering metaphorically, others are deadly serious. The pioneer of sulphate aerosol spraying, Lowell Wood, has declared We've engineered every other environment we live in. Why not the planet? A new breed of ecologist, like the American Earl Ellis, sees planetary management as an amazing opportunity, with global warming an invitation for us to take control of the climate system. And a new strand of free market environmentalists like Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus of the Breakthrough Institute, like Mark Linus, Stuart Brand and Bjorn Lomborg, they reject pessimistic assessments, arguing that through technology we can subdue na nature and impose ourselves on the future of the planet. It's a message with instant appeal to those who see humans as the species whose destiny it is to master the earth, who dream of becoming planetary overlords. Yet if the earth is to be managed, what will be the goals of the planetary strategic plan? What will be the vision statement of Earth Inc? Will the ideal state be an earth like a national park, a well-run open plain zoo in which humans are the dominant species? Or perhaps we should aim for an English country garden, carefully tended, but with corners set aside to remind us of wildness. Of course, the answer to this question will depend on who gives the orders to the Earth system engineers. If there are various control variables for operating the system, those who set them will set them in their own interests. That goes almost without saying. There seems to be no going back. The persistence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the most profound and least understood fact about human-induced climate change. The climatic effects of burning fossil fuels will last longer than Stonehenge. That the Earth has entered a new geological epoch known as the Anthropocene the age of humans. The new epoch comes after an extended period of climatic stability. 
a 10,000 year unique geological period known as the Holocene. The Holocene's mild and unusually stable climate permitted human civilization to flourish. Now the Holocene has come to an end. Humans have flourished so successfully in the sympathetic environment of the last 10,000 years that we have shifted the Earth's geological arc. The Anthropocene is defined by the fact that the human imprint on the global environment has now become so large that it rivals some of the great forces of nature and its impact on the functioning of the Earth system. It was Paul Crutzen, the Nobel Prize winning scientist who was awarded the prize for his role in, the, uh, in atmospheric chemistry in the hole in the ozone layer. Crutzen, along with ecologist Eugene Sturmer, first announced the arrival of the Anthropocene in the year 2000. In a seminal intervention, they suggested that the Anthropocene may be said to have begun in 1784 with the commercialisation of James Watt's steam engine. That's when fossil fuels began to power the Industrial Revolution. Now a debate with far-reaching implications has developed in the scientific journals over when the Anthropocene began. Contrary to the claim that the shift occurred with the Industrial Revolution, paleoclimatologist William Ruddiman argues that the Anthropocene in fact began seven or 8,000 years ago with the onset of forest clearing and settled agriculture, which led to significant increases in methane and carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. Paul Crutzen, with his colleague Will Steffen, defend the claim that the Anthropocene properly began in the late 18th century, with a suite of indicators showing that human impact on the world as a whole was not discernible seven or 8,000 years ago, and indeed only became discernible two or three hundred years ago. A step change occurred in the late 18th century. The Industrial Revolution was the event that sparked widespread and persistent change across the globe. Beyond that step, the charts show that there was another huge leap, a startling leap, after World War II. You can't see the details here, but it's pretty clear that something very dramatic started in a whole range of indicators after, after the Second World War in the 50s. Now, the dispute over when the Anthropocene began is not merely academic. One implication of this early Anthropocene hypothesis, the idea that began seven or 8,000 years ago, is that if human beings have been a planetary force since civilization began, then there is nothing fundamentally new about the last couple of centuries of industrialism. In this view, it's in the nature of civilized humans to transform the earth, and what is in the nature of the species cannot be resisted. By focusing attention on humankind in general, rather than the forms of social organization that emerged more recently, the Anthropocene becomes in some sense natural. It's not the product of industrial rapaciousness, an unregulated market, human alienation from nature, or excessive faith in technological power. It's merely the result of humans doing what humans are meant to do. That is, use the powers Prom Prometheus gave us to better our lot. In this view, there may be a better temperature or climate as a whole. And it's therefore justified for humans to set the global thermostat wherever we please. So we're beginning to see the interpretation of the Anthropocene as a new political battleground. Earl Ellis, an ally of Ruddy Men in the early Anthropocene uh, hypothesis, defends what he has called the good Anthropocene. There are no planetary boundaries that limit continued growth in human population. 
or indeed in economic advance. Human systems can adapt and indeed prosper in a hotter world because history proves our flexibility. For Ellis and those of like mind, humanity's transition to a higher level of planetary significance is what he calls an amazing opportunity. And he declared in the New York Times that, quote, we will be proud of the planet we create in the Anthropocene. In his embrace of the good Anthropocene, Ellis is joined by Ronald Bailey from the Libertarian Reason magazine, who argues that we can only become better at being the guardian gods of Earth. In this light, it's not surprising, I think, that the idea of engineering the climate is attracting the support of conservatives, including right-wing right think tanks that have been active in climate science denial, working to discredit climate science and resist all measures to cut carbon emissions. This only seems paradoxical um, if you don't recognise the deep cultural explanations for the resistance of conservatives to accept some conservatives to accepting the science of climate change. If the cure is palatable, then the patient is more likely to accept that the disease is real. Climate engineering, geoengineering, transforms climate change from a vindication of environmentalist warnings that humans have gone too far into a victory for the Human Mastery Project. The system may have created some problems along the way, but the system can solve them. So, Republican presidential candidate and former House Speaker Newt Gingrich has declared, geoengineering holds forth the promise of addressing global warming concerns for just a few billion dollars a year. Instead of penalising ordinary Americans, we would have an option to address global warming by rewarding scientific invention. Bring on the American ingenuity. For conservatives like Gingrich, the technological option obviates the need for social change. There's no need to phase out fossil fuels. No need to challenge the power of Exxon. No need for new taxes. And no need to ask consumers to change their behaviour. The American way of life is saved. And this allows conservatives to stick two fingers up at the enemy, the United Nations. And we shouldn't underestimate this urge. Earlier this year, the Republican Party convention passed a resolution condemning, quote, the destructive and insidious nature of Agenda 21. Agenda 21, as you know, is a well-meaning and non-binding set of principles agreed at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. This resolution followed a vigorous campaign by Tea Party Conservatives against local conservation initiatives like public transport, solar energy, bicycle lanes and smart meters. They claim these are in fact part of a conspiracy against the American way of life promoted by the United Nations Agenda 21. These campaigns are bewildering. Until we remember, existing energy efficiency measures and renewable energy has become a sign of red-blooded faith in the prevailing system, the particular conservative construction of the American way of life. The ideological framing of environmentally benign technology has a long history in the US. Sherwood Rowland the American chemist who shared the Nobel Prize in 1995 with Paul Crutzen for their work on the hole in the ozone layer. When Rowland um, advocated a ban on ozone destroying consumer products, the aerosol spray can industry suggested that he was in fact a KGB agent bent on destroying capitalism. If the new epic of the Anthropocene is read as the manifest destiny of humanity, then of course it's a reading that finds a much more sympathetic ear in the United States than in Europe. Even so, this Promethean dreaming meets stiff resistance in its homeland. 
the New York Times opinion pieces in which Earl Ellis and Ronald Bailey welcomed the new epoch of the good Anthropocene as a great opportunity to take control. When they did that, their views were met with a barrage of satirian objections, such as, the Anthropocene is nothing to be proud of, wrote one. The Anthropocene era may be extremely short-lived, wrote another. We have not much control over what Mother Nature has in store for us next. And another pithily commented simply, Ozymandias. <laughs> so we should remember that while US paranoia is rampant at this stage in its history, some of its strongest critics are also American. It was exactly 50 years ago that the American biologist Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, the book that launched the modern environment movement, the book that more than any other blazed the trail that led us to this festival today. To finish then, where does this all leave us? The question is not whether to reject or embrace technology. The question is, what kind of relationship are we to have with technology? Are we to be controlled by it so that it determines our destiny? Or can we find a free relation to it? For all of their celebration of human mastery, Prometheans have in fact subjugated themselves to technology, which entraps them in a certain way of thinking. If we can free ourselves from the grip of technological thinking, then we can approach the climate crisis <coughs> and climate engineering with a sensibility that does not reject the power of Earth system science and technology, but recognises their limits and their proper place. We return then to the question I posed at the outset. Should we even aspire to manage the Earth? Over the last four decades, 900 environmental treaties have been signed, and yet the Earth continues to ail. So the first question we must confront is whether we can master ourselves. Even if we could get our own house in order, and who knows, perhaps Rio plus 20 will be the breakthrough we so desperately need, we have to ask whether the Earth itself will go along with our grand plan. Perhaps turning the earth into a system, knowable and controllable, an object open to be engineered, perhaps that is the last great conceit of humanity. Perhaps instead of a well-defined system, the earth is more like a wild beast, a beast that has now been disturbed from its slumber and will shrug off our attempts to tame it with our puny technologies. Thank you. Could I start by asking, just think where you were when you arrived in this room earlier this evening, and think of it in terms of a, a glass half full or a glass half empty. Is your glass now slightly less empty than it was when you walked in, or is it slightly more full? So those who have listened to what Clive had, said, has said, had to say this evening, and your glasses, if it goes down, by the way, that's not good. If it goes up, it is good. Is your glass slightly less full than it was when you worked in, or slightly fuller? Have you, has your spirit risen a bit, or has your spirit sunk? So, whose spirit has sunk a little? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and whose spirit has risen a little? Okay, so I'd say that's a heroic band of about 10% whose spirit has risen. Second question, how many people before this evening's talk had heard about Prometheus? Hands up. And how many people had heard about Satyria? Okay, you're about half a percent. <laughs> you probably studied Greek. 
So, in these two answers, you have just confirmed for me my suggestion that what Clive has done with us this evening is to pose us one massive, great dilemma. Because the analysis that he brings us cannot do anything other than make us feel less confident about the combined resources of the environment world in general and activists and NGOs in particular, given the scale of what you've just heard about the forces that we're up against. It's extremely difficult to reflect on a presentation like that and say, yeah, that's it. We know exactly how to deal with all of that. And I'm sure James is reflecting on this with a slight sense of uh, even more profound gloom than you might be, <laughs> given that what Clive has shown us this evening is that there is already more, quotes, smart money, quotes, flowing into geoengineering solutions than I suspect has passed through Triodos in the last 15 years. <laughs> A sobering reminder that if capitalism is indeed the operating system, then the uses to which capital is put will determine our ability to manage these effects. And right now, if you think back to the list that Clive showed us of all of those people sharing in that extraordinary intellectual capital for that new geoengineering solution, you can see where the money is flowing. So why is this a problem for us? Well, and this is where I want to engage, if I may, with Clive, rather than just carry on unloading my own anxiety about all of this. I want to engage with Clive to say, where does this take us as a movement, as a group of people who are passionate still about the ability to find solutions to the problems that we confront on a daily basis? are angst-ridden about those solutions being technological in essence. And I think, Clive, at one point you said, we must free ourselves from technological thinking, which is an interesting sort of rider when you think about how we're going to offer our solutions. We confront what you've just told us, knowing full well that all you've done is to confirm for us the old adage that the devil has all the best tunes. And my challenge to you is, if you're urging us all to be soterians as we head into this new Anthropocene era, how are you going to avoid us ending up as so many soterian wallflowers while the Promethean lords and masters strut their stuff on the stage in a way that is bound to be more seductive than anything that our Soterian caution is likely to offer them. How do we do this? How do we grapple with the psychology that our set of answers to what you've just said looks deeply unappealing against that Promethean promise of maintaining a way of life that people are, let's face it, quite seduced by. Okay, um, I'm sort of tempted to say I'm a glass 10% full kind of guy. <laughs> uh, but um, more seriously, and it is a sort of profoundly serious topic, of course, look, what I'm arguing is that, is that the world has changed in some very profound ways that we have to recognise and we have to come to grips with. And uh, we can't be fighting uh, old battles that have been lost uh, because uh, we'll only lose them uh, more profoundly and we won't be in a position to fight uh, the new battle that is now being, uh, regrettably, uh, the, you know, the, the battle lines are, are being formed. So really what I'm saying, uh, in, and the, the uh, import of what I was uh, trying to communicate tonight is, we, I mean, we really have to reassess. I mean, I, I really, I, you know, I have resisted for years conceding the ground to those uh, conservatives, including conservative environmentalists, who've said, well, humans have so transformed the planet that talking about, um, you know, protecting and preserving and isolating ourselves from it is 
uh, is pointless, uh, it's past that stage and so we need to just get on with managing it. I've, I mean, I've resisted that for years because I can see the danger of it. But a point comes when, um, uh, when you really have to concede that in fact that is the case and, and, and it's based on the science. And so that's why I'm talking about Earth System Science, which has been developed. I mentioned that some of the people who have been involved in it, Paul Crutz and Will Steffen, and, uh, and, and a bunch of us who are very, uh, they're top scientists, they're extremely well motivated, they're deep environmentalists as well as being uh, exceptionally uh, good scientists. And these are just the facts that they're throwing up. So I think when uh, Paul Crutzen and others announced that we, we are such a powerful planetary force that we rival the great forces of nature to the point where we have actually changed the geological history of planet Earth after four and a half billion years. I mean, to me, this is the most profound fact that it's going to take us decades to actually understand what... I think it's as important to humanity as settled agriculture and the Industrial Revolution, and it will take us a very, very long time to think through it. I mean, even the, sci I mean, the scientists have now got a fairly good grip on it, but if you think about the philosophical, um, psychological, historical, and indeed the religious meaning of this announcement that we have entered the Anthropocene, uh, it's really something that requires us all, if I can use a horrible sort of system kind of metaphor, rewire our brains. And, and, but until we do that, when you have people like Lowell Wood and uh, David Keith and a whole string of uh, climate engineers who are blithely, I shouldn't say that about David Keith, um, because he's not doing it blithely, but he's doing it nevertheless, uh, developing and patenting these technologies and getting uh, the world's richest or second richest man to invest significant sums in it, wow, I mean, that changes everything. And we really have to come to grips with that. I don't have a clear uh, answer uh, to what we need to do. I mean, I could you know, come up with a slogan like Satyrians of the World Unite. Uh, but in a sense, that's what I'm doing. Uh, trying to mobilise our thinking so that we can confront this different threat, which is on a scale bigger than we could have conceived 10, okay. 10 or 20 years ago. Okay, but, but again, so you, you, you kind of push us a bit harder now, which is we have to give up all of the um, thinking we might have had until now. I'm very struck, for instance, that our debates in the Green Movement, if you go back, you mentioned Simon Spring, Rachel Carson, 1962, pretty much after that period of time in the 1970s, emerged a school of thinking called Deep Ecology, which you will, of course, recall, some of the leading proponents of which were writing and uh, being active in your own country in Australia. And the whole thrust of that philosophical movement at that time was to reveal the idiocy of anthropocentric thinking. So John Seed, an Australian philosopher, urged us all in the 1970s to stop thinking like human beings and start thinking like a mountain. Because until we could think our way into what it was that made natural systems work, we would always come up with these pathetic, illusory, anthropocentric, man-dominated, quasi-solutions to a problem that was bound to go wrong. And Jim Lovelock, to bring that up to date, one of the great uh, originators, of course, of Earth System Science, has nothing but contempt for anybody, whether they be on the side of the angels or on the side of some of the devils that you showed us this evening. Sorry to moralize rather crudely, but probably with me on that one. Jim Lovelock has been excoriating the criticism of anybody who thinks that we can act as full-on stewards of the earth, let alone, I love this phrase, guardian gods of earth. Wow. I mean, Jim Lovelock wrote a wonderful piece saying, we don't even know how to be stewards of the earth. And taking that word steward back to its etymological root, which of course was the sty ward, the keeper of the pigsty. And as Jim Lovelock said, if we'd only managed our pigsties better, maybe we would have some legitimacy in claiming that we could be stewards of the earth. Now we're going to have to think of ourselves as guardians of God's earth. I mean, hi, this is a philosophical mm. revolution that is yeah. making me feel quite uncomfortable, possibly mm. palpitating mm. uncomfortable. I mean, are you, are you really mm. urging us all to give up on 
40, 50 years yeah. of assiduous attempts to take yeah. man out of the yeah. center of this equation and to put nature into the center, which is really what we've been doing. Sorry, I'm summarizing rather shorthandedly, but we haven't got much time to get into a big philosophical yeah. debate. But that's what we've been doing. Well, I mean, I mean, Jonathan, you're pushing me right at the limits of my sort of thinking here. And look, you know, for for 30 years, I've been you know, deeply affected by deep ecology. And when it comes to arguments about uh, the principles on which we ought to act, I've always defended the notion of the intrinsic value yeah. of nature yeah. and, and and ecosystems and so on. But now I'm no longer a deep ecologist. You know, I'm a, it's the first time I've said that to myself, actually. Um, because, because if you think, I mean, because bearing in mind what I've said tonight, nature can have an intrinsic value only if it is radically separated from us. And it's not. It, and, it's, and its link with us can only increase uh, in profound ways. And, and uh, there was the latest edition of Nature has detailed that in, sort of in, in a horrifying way. You know, and, and the most dispassionate, dispassionate science, of course, can be very horrifying. And so, yes, you've come to the absolute core of it, um, anthropocent anthropocentrism. And my emerging view now is that the key question is not whether we take an anthropocentrist view or not, but what kind of anthropos lies at the center? What kind of human being is at the center of this kind of thinking? And the anthropos that has been at the center of anthropocentrism is the Promethean separate subject promoting mastery over nature. And what I'm saying is that, yes, we need to be anthropocentric, but a different kind of anthropos must stand at the center. OK, so I, uh, I think that's really helpful. So just to end my little um, series of inquiries here, I, again, to come back to the whole issue about governance, because it did seem to me that you were probably going some way to acknowledging that we've got to the point where we are going to have to do some geoengineering. You didn't quite spell that out, but you might have been mindful of the article in New Scientist this week, which reads as follows. Parts of the planet have seen levels of carbon dioxide rise above 400 parts per million for the first time. Although largely symbolic, the milestone is a stark reminder of humanity's powerful influence on the atmosphere. Now, this is a seasonal effect, okay? It goes to 400 when a lot of the biomass is breathing out, and it goes back down again uh, uh, later in the year. But then it averages out at 383, 390, 392, whatever it might be. First time ever above 400 parts per minute. Some of the meteorologists, the scientists, the climatologists that Clive is talking about have said that anything above 350 parts per million means we're heading to 4 degrees centigrade, 5 degrees centigrade. You've written about this very eloquently in Clive's book, which is on sale outside. You've heard not just um, The Requiem for a Species, but uh, a, a wonderful book, which you should only read if you are up for some bracing emotional self-inquiry. <laughs> and I, I say that as the strongest possible endorsement. I absolutely love that book. But it took me through the mill and back again in a way that I found extremely painful, so I am very grateful for that. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, we could, you, I think you're telling us we're going to have to embrace some kind of geoengineering, because if we're already at 400, guess what we're going to be in 10 years' time? Then the question comes, which technologies? But a much deeper question than that was the one that you were hinting at, which is how do we govern the process by which those technologies are brought forward to rescue us from the otherwise inevitable consequences of 400 parts per million, 450, 550, 600. Yeah. What's the governance, the set of governance guarantees that we need to put in place? Well, this is a question that's starting to get a little bit of thought, but it's not very good thought around the place. And uh, one of the striking things I've noticed about uh, studying the geoengineering community of scientists principally 
is the uh, strong resistance uh, from that community, most of it, to any form of regulation or restriction on what they do. They, they have developed a set of professional norms uh, which said, you know, you can trust us, uh, we're scientists, uh, we're not going to do anything that will harm the world, but the th and so we should be able to do our experiments, including testing, you know, the strato shield uh, and things like that to see whether they're going to work. But, but even though the kinds of experiments that are being proposed, and some of you will be aware of the SPICE experiment to suspend a hose uh, only a kilometre or so, uh, into the atmosphere and to pump salt water, which was something planned by a consortium of, of British universities, but which was cancelled uh, a month or two ago. Um, even, even if those experiments don't uh, cause any kind of physical damage or impact on the world, those kinds of experiments certainly change the social and political environment in which geoengineering will be considered. So my view is, uh, that what we need to do is to develop early uh, strong mechanisms for regulating and overseeing all uh, geoengineering research, which should represent in a, in a, in a, uh, a genuine way the interests um, of everyone in the world. Because, you know, we're seeing some, uh, particularly the global south, because one of the impacts of the stratospheric aerosol spraying, for example, uh, according to the models, is that it may well disrupt the in Indian monsoon. It might stop the Indian monsoon, affecting the food supply for a billion or two people. And so uh, you can see the profound importance of having international democratic governance mechanisms. OK, thank you very much both. Um, I think I'm going to draw that conversation to a close now. Um, some very profound thinking and some very cogent arguments there. Um, can I now go to you and ask you if there are any questions from the audience? I'll take that one, that gentleman there, and then there's two there. Thank you. So, apparently we're going to use the handheld mics because the system is misbehaving. So if you can wait for a microphone to come to you, um, where the handheld lights. Did they come? Yeah. So if you could just take up the gentleman in the bluey grey. That, yeah. Uh, I'd like to take up the uh, Satyrians of the World Unite um, uh, point. We've had three great talks uh, with uh, information, intelligence, and uh, wisdom. But also, we should remember that outside of this room, not only is, uh, is there an ecological crisis, but there's a more immediate economic and uh, political crisis uh, that, is, that is forming up across Europe and across the world. Um, and uh, we, we, we all know that the, uh, the, the uh, austerity is uh, the proffered solution to this, and it is uh, rather equivalent to uh, a uh, medieval uh, doctor prescribing uh, bleeding for um, a case of anemia. And we all know here in this room um, that the uh, answer is a green, is, is a stimulus, um, uh, an economic stimulus uh, based around a Green New Deal, or I would say a, an enhanced Green New Deal, a GND plus, um, that will uh, power us out of this recession into a green um, economy. And my question is this, is there any chance that uh, we, uh, the, 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 green, the green thinking movement and, and indeed the, the uh, left thinking movement um, can unite people uh, behind a manifesto uh, based on democracy, um, equity and sustainability and can unite the anger that is forming uh, throughout Europe um, behind a, a platform that will uh, give them a different, per give us a different purpose instead of being a, uh, um, a, a destructive force in nature, a constructive force in nature. Thank you. Thank you. So um, just before I ask Jonathan or Clive to uh, answer that if they've got anything, James, you've been quiet for quite a long time. Um, I think that 
I think it is pertinent because because it is the economic. Is this on? No. Yes. Okay. Uh, because because I think it's the economic the economic side of things which reminds us of our humanity. I mean, from a purely personal perspective, um, I was terrified just then by what I heard. Um, maybe I'll get easily scared. Um, but looking, looking around, I think that probably that is a natural reaction. And then we kind of go back to thoughts of the economy and we get scared by that. And then we're nullified. Um, and I don't want to be nullified. And in a way, in terms of the, in terms of the, this, the, the last comment Clive made around a different type of anthropos, this is what we need to look at, where we can be as humans relating to one another, but not trampling over nature, yet neither subjugating ourselves so much that we, we can't be human. I, I, I can't think like a mountain. I want to be a person. Um, I want to live and love like a person. And that's okay. And the economics that we need to form needs to be around that. And we can create it. It's the inequality that I find most disturbing. Um, it is the kind of the, you know, the, the sort of the, the arch demons of, of the world, which makes it just feel like it's being done to us. But actually, the only things which give me hope are the things which we can do for ourselves. And I see it being done abundantly every day. And I think that that's the kind of part where actually... Actually, the sense is that I wouldn't say that the tools are regulating things, because I don't think that will happen, because governments follow, they do not lead. We need to collectively make these things redundant by virtue of a new type of economy, not just in terms of technology, but a new type of relating to another, different types of businesses, different types of economies, which make this redundant by actually transcending it. Um, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone. I don't believe that this end, of the, that the oil or the Anthropocene will end, will end because we run out of oil. I don't think we will because I think we won't need it. And I don't think we'll need any of this. And that was a thing, that will be the ultimate thing which will burst the bubble um, of these new technologies. So I, I think James is absolutely right. To remind us that there is incredible flowering, proliferation of community-based initiatives going on. Essentially, that's what Big Green Week is about, is to celebrate and bring that together in such a way that everybody understands the combined force of it. And I think that's absolutely right. And you just have to remember that's all going on against the grain of what the markets tell us is the right way to create wealth today. So it's an astonishing achievement that this force is as powerful as it is. But the question is, could we now move on to the next stage and gather together in a Green New Deal around the green economy? And I'm sorry to say, but, but realism being a harsh taskmaster, uh, the answer to that is no. We had an opportunity to do that after the crash in 2009. Governments committed to significant packages to get that kind of investment going including the UK, United States, China, South Korea, India, all over the world. Two countries have delivered on the promises they made at that time, China and South Korea. And if you look at the combined impact of what those two countries have done around the green economy, it's actually pretty impressive. Obama has flirted with it a bit. Here in the UK, as you know, we seem to have ended up with a transfer of the exchequer who thinks ideologically in much the same way as some of the people that Clive quoted in his talk, as in Agenda 21 being the vanguard of some kind of reborn communistic plot to overthrow capitalism. I, I'm only exaggerating just a tiny bit, but not actually that much. George Osborne would be very comfortable in a session with the kind of ideologues that Clive quoted. Very comfortable. So the answer is no. OK, thank you, Jonathan. And there's a question there, uh, gentleman in the black shirt. Yeah, uh, OK, uh, hello. Uh, well, I'm from Colombia, as you can tell by my lovely accent. 
And uh, one of the problems of developing, developing countries like mine is the way that uh, technologies and knowledge and like environmental concern are transferred, especially to people with no access to education. So w which do you think is the best way to achieve sustainable, sustainable development? Like it's just a matter of like inve large invest on like state of the art technologies or do you think like, it can also be built like uh, locally? You know? Um, I, think, but I think both is the, is the only answer one can give. I'm thinking particularly here of solar power. Um, there's been a big debate going on for years now whether we should see solar power as a solution at house scale or community scale or school scale or factory scale and, and that we can do everything through solar off-grid and that's one of the ways in which Germany has flourished or whether we need huge solar farms covering square kilometers of desert or very hot, arid land. And there's another school of thought that says that we need very big, mega scale solar farms to do the job. I think this is a completely stupid debate. I think we need both. And if you look at the speed with which solar technology is now moving forward, and the closeness between us and what is called the grid parity moment, the moment where solar delivers a unit of electricity at the same or a lower price than the same unit from any other source. And we're probably going to be there in 2014 in most of the world. Australia's already there, theoretically. Obviously not with Clive's politicians in charge, but they're there <laughs> te technically. And the best estimates are now that we'll probably get to that grid parity moment all around the world by 2016, 2017. Then we just want it everywhere. We want it in villages, in communities, on schools, in hospitals, in huge, great manufacturing facilities. We want it on land. We want it embedded in buildings. We want it ground-mounted. We want it bio-enabled. We want it nano this and everything else. Just the whole lot. And it's the most exciting thing. I'm sorry, sorry, Clive, I'm having a moment of technological overexcitement here. <laughs> but it's a damn sight better than geoengineering, I'll tell you that. And in fact, I think it's the way in which we will avoid the geoengineering trap. Right. Jonathan, coming on on technology. Can I just take a question there, and then there's a question there. Is there anybody else? Oh, Thank you. I would have liked to have answered Jonathan's uh, question about the glass being higher or lower. Unfortunately, mine stayed at the same level, but turned darker and more poisonous. <laughs> Geoengineering is a little frightening after all. It also show, started to show that it was full of teeming mankind, unrestrained by the natural predators of plague and early death. Both of which combine to make me think we're going to need a new world politic. Any suggestions? Any suggestions, John? My view on these kinds of questions is, is that history is notoriously unpredictable. Um, and sometimes uh, well-meaning and well-motivated people can work away and write books and campaign and do all the right things for, for decades and nothing much happens. And then for some reason that it's hard to divine even in retrospect, the world suddenly shifts. So there's some sort of gestalt shift in history. I mean, you might think of the, you know, the women's movement in the 70s, for example, or late 60s when you know, they'd, for decades there'd been work by groups and individuals and so on, which had achieved some, some, some uh, uh, shifts, but then something happened in the 60s, 70s, which suddenly changed the whole orientation. There were massive advances over the next 10 or 20 years. So um, my view is that, uh, you know, we, we have to keep doing what we do uh, as well as we can, adapt to the situation, and um, 
and hope uh, that the historical circumstances ar arise, uh, arrive in time. That's, uh, you know, when I, in my more pessimistic moments, uh, which tend to predominate, um, you know, that's, you might sort of actually, you know, amongst Christians, not that I'm a Christian, but I'm very interested in the notion of Christian hope, uh, which I think is a very powerful force. But, you know, if you sort of historicise that, you can see uh, things, whether it's the abolition of slavery or uh, the women's movement or other great historical moments, which uh, people work away for decades and hope that some change will come along and then for reasons often quite unpredictable, suddenly things change. Okay, good, thank you. Now I'm going to, I think we've, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to ask uh, for three or four questions. There's one there, one there, one there, and the cameraman at the back wants to ask a question as well. So uh, if, if you Thank you. Uh, while I agree that we should travel, hopefully, I think the, um, <coughs> and even if we manage to um, push this boulder up the hill uh, that we are having to do and manage to convert all the uh, uh, right-wing opposition or the, or the deniers and so on, converted them all, we would still have a really impossible task because of the human population. Homo sapiens is unopposed. And this is the problem. We, we need something to be predatory on us instead of us being uh, predatory on everything else on, on the planet. And that is the problem. Now, you could suggest some facetious ideas, such as the only, uh, the only thing that would be predatory would be, uh, say, bacteria. So we stop the medical schools, stop the doctors, and so on. You know, how do you do it? It is actually an impossible task, even if we converted everybody to our side with the burgeoning human population. Okay, can, can I ask you to be quick? There's a question there as well. So we've got, uh, the, uh, we've got the predating the human I'm very encouraged that we're having this debate and as a consequence I believe my glass is definitely increasing and the fact that we've got this debate here in Bristol today only reinforces my view that this is why Bristol should be the European green capital <laughs> but my challenge back to the panel is that by virtue of having this discussion an external party would not then look at us and say oh, well, there is confusion, there's lack of clarity, we perhaps should be holding back on investment in any technologies. And my challenge is, are we in a position whereby we can actually stop at the moment? <coughs> we'd flood Holland, we wouldn't operate the Thames barrier, and we'd end up with power sources at the moment which are obsolete and continue to pollute our planet. Thank you. Um, so if we can go to the cameraman and then to the gentleman here in the grey shirt. Um, my issue is, like a friend of mine came up with a term which said you can't, you can't offset a social relation. And for me, like, even, even if you did deal with these issues, I don't know if it's a world I'd want to live in. You know, I think that, you know, I'm more worried about capitalism killing everyone before climate change does. I think we fundamentally need to change the social relations of people and this huge inequalities of wealth and power if we're going to get anywhere. I don't, I don't see how we can carry on with growth or any of this. And, um, there is the alternative conference going on at the moment in Rio, which has just produced a Commons manifesto about how um, all Earth's resources should be held in common and not there to be exploited by people with power and money. So I just wonder what you think of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, I feel very reluctant to speak now because I, I looked at this, it's called the Festival of Green Ideas, uh, sorry, part of it was, and I looked at it, it's actually the Festival of, kind of Male Ideas, and the, all the speakers, the speakers tonight actually, yeah, they're all referring to men, and I've booked two events that actually are led by women, they've both been cancelled unfortunately, and I wonder, you know, what confidence, you know, and what, what that says to, to the audience in here is that the, in here it is a very gender balanced. And it, 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 it all appears, and, 
And they're, they're, you know, uh, unfortunately, they, and if the ladies are reluctant to speak and we're just more mouthy, um, or they, they know that you know, saying that um, keep quiet, people think me a fool, or open my mouth and remove all doubt. Thank you. And I, I think actually, do you want to ask the same question? Or, or, and this is have to be the last one, I'm afraid. And then we have this the is the, the three second plea of the same statement. Why is it that the women in the room have said, damn all? Why is it that the people on the stage are all men? Why is it that it even took me until the last, you know, 99 and a half second to get my voice out? We're missing half the debate, half the skills, half the possibilities, just over half the possibilities, because there's slightly more women than men in the world. And somehow it feels as if the vibrancy and hope that maybe women's voices could bring isn't given enough space. And I don't know how to do anything about that either. And okay. I am a woman, I think. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So we've, we've got a question about Homo sapiens being unopposed, and we need to have some predation of the human species. Um, but what can we do if we just stop development, uh, as was suggested just now? Um, and what about the social relationships and changing that whole area um, of relative inequalities that we have? And then there's the issue of the male dominance of uh, this debate. And, and I agree. Um, it would be nice to hear from some of your sisters uh, as well. So, uh, on the floor. James. I'll be brief. I think it's all the same question. Do we need a new world politics? I think something magical will happen when we stop asking that question and ask what we can do. I really do. I think that there's something around population inequality of all forms which we can only really kind of get down to, to the sort of the tax of actually kind of doing it ourselves. We need to be able to negotiate this for ourselves. People aren't going to come into this room, to this chamber, and sort it out for us. It is only going to be by some new form of self-organisation, by better relation to, it, to ourselves. I think the inequality kind of point is, is one of the biggest drivers. And inequality, as we all know, is a big driver of unhappiness, clearly for the people at the bottom. But when you're at the top of the slope, you're still at the slope, and it's actually statistically not making people happier at the top. That is the thing which we need to be able to relate to ourselves much better as human to human to be able to create new forms. It's not going to come by some other form above us coming and telling us how to do it. I just, can I, whether we can get a, some of those being stand up there. Oh. Thank you. Um, I mean, just as the politician on, uh, on the table, I'm only here really just to introduce it. But what I would like to say, and I think that, that those speakers who have made a plea for gender balance are absolutely right. And actually, on reflection, Prometheus is very male orientated. It's basically toys for boys. Um, and, you know, the, the names, I don't think there was a single woman up there in terms of the people who were making a claim and a plea to uh, address uh, geo-technologies and so on. This is all men running the city, running the world, running uh, the civilization, unfortunately. And until we get that balance, that satirian balance, we're stuffed. And that is the bottom line. We have to get that. And it's a real challenge because, as you said, the women here have just sort of accept it and you were the only one who actually spoke out and that is ridiculous and it is some and it's probably it's it's certainly as politicians it's our fault you know I'm a male politician I, I can't change that some people might think I ought to but it, it is it's impossible to change myself but it isn't isn't possible uh, impossible to change the way we run things in Bristol and I think that is a, it's a really strong message and I think if people go away with one message tonight is how can we rebalance between Prometheus and Toys for the Boys and Satyrians, then that is a really useful lesson for us all to go away with. Thank you. Uh, 
So um, there's quite a lineup that we've got to deal with there. We've got this overpopulated, male dominated, grotesquely inequitable world, <laughs> and we have to deal with all of those things before we can do sustainability. Now, I, we know we don't, we, we haven't got space for this stuff. We know that the sustainability revolution that we're talking about here is premised on an understanding of different patterns of relationship, different ways in which we build trust and community between each other in the work that we do. So I'm not going to give you any sort of rah-rah stuff about that. Um, I, think on, I think in terms of the program as a whole, by the way, for Big Green Week, I think the balance between speakers is, is just about 50-50, if I remember rightly, in my last discussions with colleagues. I may have got that a little bit wrong, but is it nearly 50-50? Almost, I think. Sorry, I mean, I'm... And slightly in ladies' favours. Oh, is it? Okay, sir. But that's not... That's, I'm only just passing that on as a piece of factual information. Um, thanks, by the way, for throwing another Greek sufferer into the pot here in terms of Sisyphus, who had to push his stone up the hill. Um, just a little word in favour of Prometheus before we leave this debate. Prometheus stole fire from the gods. Prometheus refused to apologize for that and as a consequence was punished by the gods by being chained to a rock with an eagle eating his liver every day which then grew back every night and the eagle descended every day and ate a new liver or a bit of a liver sounds like regenerative medicine to me but there we are now without Prometheus stealing the fire it would be a pretty grim prospect for humankind. And in that fire is the potential for humankind to build a just, equitable, balanced, sustainable world. Because that fire is just as easily expressed via trapping the energy of the sun as it is via taking stored solar energy out of the earth in terms of coal, oil, and gas and burning it to the detriment of the whole of humankind. I, I'm, I'm a bit nervous about an anti-Promethean crusade here because I think probably I want to turn Prometheus's gift to humankind to the best possible outcome, which is to use technology really intelligently and sensitively to build better worlds, for better, a better world for people all over this world, including those who would find this debate perhaps a little detached from their daily reality at the moment including the 1.3 billion people who are not connected to any Promethean fire whatsoever. So... Need balance. Well, thank you. That's what I was struggling to say, rather long-winded. Yes, balance. Bring in Soteria again.